So animals have to be able to communicate with each other to either um, find a mate, to let other animal know that there are danger, um, or there are dangers in the area, or maybe to let other animals know that this is their territory. There are different mechanisms of communication. Chemical communication can be used um, day and night, and it uses things, um, so chemicals called pheromones, which can be found within um, urine and feces and other um, glandular secretions. Um, these secretions can be sprayed in an area and be used to keep other animals away from this area or possibly to attract mates um, for different um, things. So here's an example of pheromone release. In this case, the animal is spraying a tree to probably mark the territory. This is my area. Auditory communication is faster than chemical. And again, it can be used day and night and can be used to mark territory, can be used to find a mate, um, to show distress, other things. So here we have um, vervet monkeys that when there is a, a potential predator in the area, they're going to send out certain um, noises. They're going to howl or screech. Um, depending on the type of predator, if it's um, something in the air that could come down, they will send a different type of yell versus um, a you know something that is on the ground that that they have to get away from. Visual communication is typically used during the day, not at night but can be very effective at helping to um, keep predators away or to help you find um, a mate. And so this video here, I'm not going to play it, but it's a really good video that you should play. It's um, amazing. And it shows how cuttlefish can change their colors to um, fend off potential um, predators and to um, show a potential mate how they're feeling. It's really cute. Uh, fireflies at night, so this is a visual that's in the evening, will light up and they'll actually do a little dance to try to attract mates. And then we have tactile communication. So this is where you have touching uh, to help you identify either potential food areas um, to to keep or to to keep um, certain animals away or to identify a possible mate. So here's a waggle dance that honeybees do to help show other bees where food is located. So behaviors are going to affect fitness. Fitness is, um, de is determined by your ability to survive and reproduce in an, in an environment, and your behavior will affect your ability to survive. Territoriality is the ability to defend your home so that no other organisms will get in there and take your food or your mates. Um, territoriality can be costly because it takes energy to fight off potential predators. So you have to make sure that the benefits outweigh the cost. If you have your own territory, then you have an environment and you're more likely to reproduce than someone who doesn't have their own environment to live in. And this is um, a video showing 
territoriality, um, one ape yelling at another ape to stay away. Uh, foraging for food is another behavior, and the um, type of food that you're going to take in needs to be high enough in energy to uh, keep you from having to go out further. So like, I guess the example would be, if you're going to get a certain type of food, it has to be high in energy and the potential for getting hurt or harmed while you're out hunting or foraging for this food has to be lower than the amount of energy you're going to gain. And so here's the example that um, your textbook uses. The amount of energy that is gained by eating certain muscles um, will determine this, the muscle size. If you get very small muscles, you can take in a lot of them. They're easy to open, but you don't get very much energy per muscle. So you're actually expending more energy than you're taking in. A really large muscle will give you more nutrients, but it's so hard to open that it would take so long to open, it wouldn't be um, feasible. This again, you're putting more energy in just to open that one shell. So muscles in that middle area between 10 and 20 um, millimeters are going to give the most return for the muscles that you get. Does that make sense? I hope. If not, ask me about it, okay? Um, sexual selection is another type of selection that will influence behavior or will affect a type of behavior, I should say, that affects fitness. Um, typically, females are the ones that are the most choosy, and that's because we have um, we have a limited number of eggs, and we put a lot of energy into our eggs. Whereas males tend to fertilize as many eggs as possible, um, and so they're going to basically be like, I don't care who I'm fertilizing, so long as my sperm are what fertilize the eggs. There are examples where males are the choosy ones, but that's not near as common because in general, males don't or aren't the ones that get to or that take care of the offspring. Here are two examples, um, and you can watch these videos. They're very adorable, um, of sexual selection. The top one, you're seeing two animals fighting over a mate. And in the bottom one, you're seeing two birds that are trying to impress a mate by their, um, their show, their tail feather show. So behaviors can also be affected by the environment you live in. A society is, um, or societies form when living in a group is actually more beneficial reproductively than um, living alone. So if you're living in a group in a society, then you can actually gain benefits by helping to um, care for your siblings or care for your um, siblings' children. Um, in the society, you're more likely to have food, you're more likely to be able to stay away from and avoid predators. But just like any um, social group, you're going to have disputes and illness is going to be more common because if one organism gets sick, then other organisms in that same group are likely to get sick. The term altruism is an interaction that potentially decreases fitness, which makes no sense because um, why would you ever want to decrease your fitness? But if we look at within a society, um, Altruism actually can benefit 
the fitness of the entire group. And so kin selection is, a, is a, an altruistic behavior where animals that have very similar genes can actually benefit by raising someone else's offspring. Um, in honeybees, the siblings are more like each other than the parent to offspring. And therefore, if I am a sibling I and I raise my, my siblings' children, then it's almost like I'm raising my own children. Inclusive fitness is fitness that results from um, personal reproduction, reproduction and helping non-descendant relatives reproduce. So if, again, if I don't have offspring, but I help raise my relative's offspring, then I am, my genes are being passed on through that, uh, uh, through that relative of mine. And so here we have meerkats that can babysit or um, protect their siblings. That's one example. I gave you the honeybee example as well. Reciprocal altruism is helping one um, organism in a society, one animal in a society, that will eventually benefit the entire group. So you might not be benefiting yourself, but the entire um, population is going to do much better in the future because of what you did. All right, I have a video that we'll watch, and then we're going to go into Chapter 33, which is, hold on, I just said it, Population Ecology. I'm so excited to be here. I can't wait to start. I don't know why we like do things for each other, like why we help our friends move even though we hate doing it, and for that matter, why a bee will sacrifice its life by stinging an intruder to protect the hive. Why would a vampire bat regurgitate blood into the mouth of another bat that hasn't eaten that day? Why? Very nice vampire bat, I guess. Ugh. That's gross in like so many ways. It turns out that this is actually a pretty big question. Things like this have been stumping scientists for years. Charles Darwin thought that altruistic behavior was a potentially deal-breaking flaw for his theory of natural selection. If the game was survival of the fittest, natural selection couldn't possibly favor a behavior that made us less likely to survive. Or could it? Darwin studied beehives and realizes that since sterile worker bees were helping their blood relatives, especially the queen, natural selection might favor altruism within related groups. A hundred years later, in 1964, a British scientist named William Hamilton actually came up with an equation to explain this. He figured altruism could evolve as a trait if genetic relatedness times the benefit of the action was greater than the cost of the individual. In other words, since some behavior is hereditary, the genes responsible for altruistic behavior could evolve if its benefit exceeded whatever cost it had for the individual because it helped the individual's relatives enough to make it worthwhile. Hamilton called this idea inclusive fitness, expanding Darwin's definition of fitness, basically how many babies somebody's making, to include offspring of other relatives. Hamilton's ideas were a humongous hit with other scientists because, for starters, it explained stuff like ant colonies. Ants have virtually no personal lives. Everything they do, they do for the good of the colony.